Good morning, neighbors. And this is an exciting day in this past few days of cold and chilly and snow and everything that's been going on. And the amazing thing is, is before we know it, it'll be summer. Uh, before we know it, we'll hopefully get back to some sort of, of normalcy and we'll be able to sip coffee together, be able to get together, and uh, be able to worship together very shortly. And that is it, very exciting. What's a big disappointment in all of this that's going on right now is the fact that Mother's Day is a, a big day on our calendar. Uh, none of us would be here if it wasn't for our mothers. A uh, lot of us, uh, the way uh, we care for one another, the way we take care of one another, things that we learn in the nurturing part of our upbringing comes from our mothers. And so it's amazing how popular this day has become. Mother's Day, um, majority of phone calls uh, are made on this day to their mothers. And that's, I find that amazing. Ironically, the greatest amount of numbers of collect phone calls are on Father's Day. And so I just find that unique and comical. You know, many of us, uh, we have wonderful women that have raised us to be who we are today. And as I think about even my own wife, Jessica, as a mother of five children, um, and four wonderful children, and there's one other kid. Um, no, five wonderful children. And not only that, uh, is able to harness being the head of an MRI department, being able to take care of a house and a family, and it's just amazing. I'm in awe. I, I sometimes, I figure out, try to figure out how she has all the energy to do all of these things. But as I can tell this morning, you know, every one of her kids, are they love her very much. We have Violet with us here this morning with my wife, and the other kids are at home. And, and uh, But they've been working. They had saved up all of their money to buy some gifts for Mom on Amazon, and she actually got one of those gifts yesterday. Um, but they had pulled all of their money together to get a couple of things because they, what uh, Winter said, my oldest daughter, is she doesn't spend money on herself ever. And so they pulled all of the money that they got from babysitting and birthdays and all of that just so that they could get a gift for their mother. You know, it's, a, it's amazing that this on the church calendar is right up there with Christmas and Easter when it comes to church attendance. Uh, usually one of the wishes that a lot of children honor on this day is they go to church with their mother. And so it's amazing how we celebrate this day. And when I think about this in, in a biblical perspective, there's a lot to say. We, we grow up in a very patristic society, meaning that it's a very male-dominated, male-domineering society. But the equality that we find in Scripture, when we even open up the very first chapter of Genesis, it says that he created male and female in his image. And that image is the unity that we see between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that between man and woman that there was equality and unity, just like we see in the Godhead. And so when I look down through, it wasn't until really the fall of, of mankind that we see that there's a division in this idea of a hierarchy that's going on. But there's very quickly some very powerful women that if it wasn't for their faith and for their dedication, we wouldn't have the story that we believe in today. Even We wouldn't even have Jesus. And I'll point to that later on. I think of Moses, and I think of his mother, Jochebed. You know, look at the faith. They, at that time, all of the Hebrew male children were being put to death. They were being drowned in the in Nile River. They were doing all kinds of things. And here's Jochebed. She hides her son, has her, her, his sister Miriam, 
uh, watch him and sees that Pharaoh's daughter would be bathing near this area of reeds and this Egyptian princess had uh, sympathy for this little male Hebrew child and Miriam actually uh, volunteers to take her back and find somebody to nurse the child. And so uh, Jochebed actually gets to raise Moses. And so not only does he get raised in the Egyptian household as basically a prince of Egypt, uh, so to speak, but his mother actually got to raise him in his Jewish upbringing, and his Israelite background. And so he had both sides of that knowledge growing up. You look at uh, one of the very first judges. She's the fourth judge of Israel, Deborah. Uh, there was a place called Deborah's Tree, and she was sought to be one of the most righteous judges ever in the history of Israel. Um, there's other people that I'll mention later that we don't consistently put in the, in the story, but the, we need to pay attention to that form our, our belief system, the mothers that really helped, th that encouraged the story along where we have in Egypt, uh, from Egypt to Israel to Jesus. And so as we look at through that here this morning, I want to start out with one of my very uh, favorite Proverbs, Proverb 31, starting at verse 10. And it says, a wife of a noble character, character who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still dark. She provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand she holds the distaff the, and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor, extends her hands to the needy. When it snows she has no fear for her household for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garment and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and, she, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her work bring her praise at the city gates. You notice everything that we read in this proverb is saying everything that she does. And and when I look at this, I really see my wife in this. She gets up early in the morning most of the time. The sun's not even about to, to shine. And then she goes to bed most of the time at late, making sure all of the kids are comfortable, tucked in at bed at night, uh, made sure they have eaten well. You know, she's the one that makes sure that all of the homework is done. She's the one that makes sure that if anything needs to be caught up in the house. And, and, and you look at all those things, but... You, you look at this, it's all the things that she does. And look at the sensitive things that she does. She notices the poor. She takes care. She closes, clothes even people outside of her household. If there's someone in need, she makes sure that they're taken care of. She makes sure that people eat. Uh, she buys a field. Notice that she, with her own money, buys her own field. And so there's a confidence that she knows what she is doing. And she's able to attend and make a field and be able to purchase this on her own. And, and look at all the things, and, and because of this, because of her noble character, look at, look at how she is able to raise her children, that her children call her blessed, and all of because they look at this and they're like, how is this possible? And then we think of all of the things that mothers go through, even the process of childbirth. It's not like it's a walk in the park, but you know, there's a struggle. Imagine carrying someone within you for nine months, and then the pain that you have to go through, but the joy that's in the end in all of that. And so I find that interesting as we celebrate mothers. And oftentimes we, we don't celebrate them as, as much as we should even in our churches. Because if it wasn't for our mothers, majority of us that are in church today, 
it's because of our mothers or our grandmothers or someone on our, uh, the female side that brought us to church. And so as you go down through, I find it interesting in Matthew, and I don't know if you've ever paid much attention at the genealogy of Jesus that, op uh, that opens up here in Matthew, and we have a bunch of, of men and, and that are listed, but within there are some interesting names that we need to pay attention to. Think about Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now, Tamar is named specifically in this genealogy. Now, usually in Israelite genealogy, everything is transferred down through the man. So why would there be this idea of Tamar? Now, Tamar is an interesting story in and of itself. Uh, the sons of, of, of Judah... Uh, she was married to them, and but he didn't give the okay for the last son to marry her, and and so that was their tradition, and so she had to dress up as a temple prostitute. I want to repeat that, a temple prostitute. She was outside the temple gates, and Judah goes past, notices her, and then they go home, and then she conceives the child, and he gives a signet ring and his staff. And so after this is all said and, and they find out that Tamar is pregnant, Judah orders for her to be stoned or killed. And she brings him his signet ring and his staff and Judah quickly repents and relents of that and says she's a more righteous person than even I am. That is the genealogy of Jesus. And as you go down through there, you also have Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Now, if it wouldn't have been for Naomi bringing Ruth up underneath her, you see two women working together in faith right there, and that we see Ruth in the lineage of Jesus. And then you, as you go down through, we finally get to Mary, the mother of Jesus. All three of those women are mentioned in the genealogy, which is unique to our understanding and traditions about how we pass on our lineage. And it's, so I find it interesting that uh, Levi, the author of Matthew, or Matthew, takes the time to make sure that, say, these are the women involved in Jesus' lineage. And as you go through there, we have the birth of Jesus. And there's a lot of things that I want to point to. Because imagine that you're Mary in this story. You're a virgin. You're betrothed to be married to Joseph, and there's some things in the story that we need to pay attention to. You know, the angel comes to her and, and says that you're going to conceive of the Holy Spirit, and the child within you will be called Emmanuel, and, and, and he will be the, 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 the savior of the world, basically. But here you understand that you are betrothed to Joseph and how that's going to appear. Now, when Joseph discovers this, he decides that he would... Rather than have her stoned to death, according to their tradition, he would put her away quietly. And what that can mean in a lot of different situations is what it would be, say, even in our own country, say, 60 years ago, where somebody within your family became pregnant who was not married, and they went to live with aunt and uncle so-and-so in the Midwest or some, uh, somewhere for a period of time. And so that the, the local community wouldn't see her go through the process of being pregnant and see her getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then make the, the whole community make judgments about what had happened because there's the usual tradition that when someone is betrothed, there's a whole year that goes into that before you bring that person into your household. And so, so Joseph said, you know, I'm going to put her away quietly. Now we know that the angel Gabriel came to him and said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. But Mary did go away for a period of time. Remember, she went to be with Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth at this time is pregnant with John the Baptist. And so when Mary comes along, we remember the story that how John the Baptist leapt within the womb of Elizabeth, rejoicing that the Messiah within Mary was present. And so for several months, three months, Mary spent with Elizabeth and Zechariah and then finally went home. 
And so there's a lot. Now imagine for a moment, Mary goes home. Here's Joseph as well, back to their community. And as small communities tend to be, I'm sure there was gossiping and slander and all these things. And this is something that we don't often consider that Mary struggled with. Knowing what was promised to her, but how people were treating her. We even remember after Jesus is born and he begins teaching in the temple and doing all of these things, they say, well, isn't this the son of Joseph the carpenter? And so even within their hometown, there's like, yeah, huh, we, we, we know the story. We figured it out, Mary. Yeah, it's the Messiah. Yeah, it's some sort of miracle. This is the way her community treated her. And so as I think about all of these things that are happening, you, you go to Luke and you can go to chapter 1 and you can hear the, see the story where, where Mary went away for three months and then went back home. And so Mary was traveling quite well during those days. But notice though throughout Mary's life, even even when it was before the time for Jesus to be even doing miracles, Mary knew. Mary knew even deep within her because at the, in the, at the wedding feast at Cana, the miracle of turning the water into wine, Mary knew that Jesus had the power to do this and even goes up to Jesus and says, look, Jesus, they, they've run out of this. And, 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 and on the very forefront, you see Jesus' rebuttal to that. What does that mean to me? It's not my time for miracles, Mom, basically is, is what he said. But then you see as she leaves the room, she, she says, do whatever he tells you to do, speaking of Jesus. And so when she leaves the room, what does he do? He does the exact request of his mother, honoring the Ten Commandments. And so you see that there's an attachment to his mother, and there's an attachment even throughout his life and his ministry to even the very end. And so as we, we look at this, look at what it says in, in John. It, he, he looks down through here, and it says that, uh, in verse 25 of, of chapter 19, it says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, this is John, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to this disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. One of the last dying wishes of Jesus was to make sure that his mom was being taken care of. And being that John was one of the youngest disciples, it turned out that he did take Mary in. Now, it's amazing through all of this, throughout his ministry, his mother is by his side. His, his mother and a group of women. In fact, what I find even more powerful in this is it's the women in the story that really draw out the whole entire circle that needs to go on to our understanding. Because the very first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus were the women. In fact, it was the women who got up early in the morning before the sun was up on their way to the tomb of Jesus to anoint his body because his body had been put to rest in such a rush before. Remember, he died somewhere near 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and according to sabbatical and rabbinical law, they needed to put his body away before sundown, or they would be considered ceremonially unclean to celebrate Passover. And so... The women, the very first and foremost, before the men are even out of bed, they're on their way to the tomb of Jesus. And they don't know how they're going to move the stone away from the tomb. They don't know how they're going to get past the Roman officers. All they wish to do is to anoint the body of Jesus. And it was a group of women that saw the resurrected Jesus. It was a group of women that went back to tell Peter and John and the rest of the disciples that finally got Peter and John up to run all the way to the tomb 
to witness and see that the tomb was empty indeed. And only John, it says, knelt down and peered in and immediately believed at that point. But it was the women that were the very first converted believers of the resurrected Messiah. And so as you look down through that and you see the empty tomb in the story, I think that we need to pay attention to the fact that the, the power of our mothers, the women in our faith history, that lead us and nurture us and grow us. Think of your Sunday school teachers. Majority of them were women when you were, ch when you were children. We have some great teachers here even at Fox Street. But most of them were the women that took the time to to raise our children in our nurseries, in our Sunday schools. You know, it, that was our nurturing that was coming up through all of these things. And so when we come to celebrate Mother's Day, and, and I can compare it to what we read in Proverbs 31, starting at verse 10, we need to make sure that we, as, a, as humanity, as mankind, really do not take for granted the women of faith that have brought us to where we are today. In fact, the notable women, I, I took you back to, I could, I could go back to Sarah, I could go back again to Jochebed, I could go to Rachel, I could go to Leah, I could go to all of these ones that, you know, it really was their faith. There's a lot of barrenness found in the Old Testament where women weren't able to conceive and it says that God opened their womb. Why? Because of their prayer, because of their faith. And so, you know, believe it or not, we here in humanity, mankind, wouldn't be here if it weren't for women. And in fact, uh, most of us men don't even know the pain that most women go through in the process. Not just the physical form of childbirth, but watching your children grow up and, and, and trying to encourage them when they struggle or skin their knee or whatever they go through, you go through it as well. And so, as we celebrate Mother's Day here today, and while we're still through this COVID-19 quarantine and while it's loosening up a little bit, I pray that we take the time to ponder if your mother is with us and, 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 and is, is alive, I pray that you reach out to them and wish them a very happy Mother's Day. Perhaps that you're healthy enough and you know you're well enough that you can actually greet them face to face. And if they're not with us, they've gone on to be with the Lord. I want you to remember the, all the good stories that you have and think of how you got to be where you are here today. You know, no matter what, our parents have done the best that they could with the situation and the culture that they were raised up in. But you know what? A lot of us are the reason why we are here today, even in church, is because of our mothers, our faithful mothers. And so we spend so much in our society of being a male-dominated society when we really need to recognize and, and really appreciate all the women that really pick up all of the areas that we fall short on as guys. And so it's about time, I hope, in my lifetime that we recognize that uh, there's equality that's found um, in humanity and in the faith. That it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek, male or female, all are equal um, in the eyes of God. And I pray that in my lifetime, my daughters will be able to break through the glass ceiling and there will be equality in our culture, but if not, I'm raising my daughters to recognize that they are ladies of worth. And, and that they don't need to find their worth because of what a man says their worth is. Um, as you look at Proverbs 31, this person did things for the sake of everyone around her. And so that's what we need to, maybe that's something we as a church need to remind ourselves. It's not so much about how well we take care of ourselves, it's about how well we take care of mankind. How well we take care of our families, how well we take care of our, our communities, and the women in our lives, those are the examples that we need to look up to. If it, you know, if it wouldn't have been for um, uh, Naomi mentoring Ruth 
you know, all of the things that Ruth had gone through. Uh, you, you look at all that, and, and if you look at the genealogy of Jesus, there's it's purposely put in there about the faithful women that went beyond means to make sure that the Messiah would come. And even though that the world was pushing back to make sure that he wouldn't, he still came. And even throughout his life, he loved his mother to the very end. Even though he knew he was going to be ascending to his father, he wanted to make sure that his mother, who stood by him all of the way, was there and taken care of. And so I pray that we'll take from Jesus' own example and the way that he viewed his mother, and even the very first converted disciples that saw the resurrected Jesus, Mary, 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 <laughs> and a bunch of other ladies that were there that day to anoint the body for Jesus, they were there to see the resurrected Savior. And they were the ones to give the very first um, statement, the very, very first uh, 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 statement saying, He lives. And even, even in their testimony, you remember the people that were on the road to Emmaus said some women came back and told us that Jesus was alive, but where are they? They're on their way home. But Jesus had to meet them there and said, hey, listen to those ladies. Here I am. I broke the bread and I disappeared. And they said, boy, didn't our souls burn within us when we talked with him? And so... Thank you. Thank you for the women of faith that have brought us along in the history of the church. And in the Church of God, Reformation Movement, I want to thank you for all of the women that still that are in leadership today. I want to thank you for where the Church of God movement is now and where you're urging it to move forward to also. And so I just want to thank you all mothers Happy Mother's Day. Uh, may you take care of your mothers the best you know how. Children, if you're listening to this today, hey, find something that your mom likes to, to snack on. Maybe some chocolate, maybe some M&Ms, maybe whatever it is, and maybe surprise them with that kind of a gift here today. You know, as we get together, I want to end with a word of prayer. I'm looking forward to at the possibility of Memorial Day weekend, of being able to gather together if the government allows us to do so. And it looks like that is a great possibility to happen. Also, I would like to invite you Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock starting this week as we'll be getting together for prayer meeting. And so I hope to encourage you to come out for that. You take the precautions you wish to take as we gather together. And so... I want to encourage us to begin thinking about gathering together again and moving ahead with the vision in, in the world that is now laid bare before us because we have a mission field that is ripe and it is ready for to see the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. There's so much fear that's going on. This world needs hope. And I pray that the Fox Street Church of God will be one of those lighthouses that can give hope to a community that all they see and all they hear is fear. And so would you pray with me here this morning? Heavenly Father, we want to come before you this day so thankful for the wonderful women that you have put in our lives and in our paths that have helped encourage us and brought us along, that have raised us, that have reared us, that have provided sustenance for our bodies, that have uh, created ways. There are so many ways that I even know that mothers can just be able to... Uh, move a budget in a way to be able to make sure every need is taken care of. And I know that there are many nights out there that mothers are awake trying to figure out the next day that are going on, but it's through their faith in you that it makes them be able to get up the next morning ready to just be able to take on the day, take care of their family, take care of their children the best way they know how. And in a world and a culture that is so, so male-dominating, Father God, I pray that in our lifetime we would find the equality that we have in Christ, that we would find the unity that we have in you, 
and that we would be united together, that it doesn't matter what race you are or what gender you are, that we're all equal when it comes to serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I pray right now in Jesus' name for every situation that's going on, for everyone that's healing from surgery, for those who are struggling financially and emotionally. And Father God, whatever the needs that are going across this uh, telephone here this morning as we record here on Facebook Live, Father God, I just pray that you would meet each and every soul in a very powerful way, knowing that you're very real and very present. And so, Father God, I, I thank you for the privilege, and it's an honest privilege to be able to minister to the, such a wonderful group of people here at Fox Street and other individuals who are watching this morning. I pray that this message would reach everyone well. And we thank you and we love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you neighbors here for this morning, but I also have a, an important message that someone wants to share with you here this morning. Violet, what would you like to share with them here this morning? Happy Mother's Day! <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. And so have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day, neighbors, and be blessed. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs>